Hello, Journey. Good morning. So good to see you at Apopka. We welcome you. We're glad you're here, especially if this is your first time with us. Thank you for being here. We want to welcome those at Lake County. I was out at Lake County last week. Always loved my times to hang out at Lake County, and they had a great kickoff this past Tuesday just for so many in the Lake County community just saying this is what a multi-site church looks like. So way to go, uh, Pastor Russell in Lake County. And we welcome those that are joining us online. Hey, a great online story to share with you just real quick. So a couple weeks ago, when I was at the Apopka campus, a lady uh, came forward and she was just really moved by what God was doing in the service and what she'd heard in the message. And, and, and she said to me that she came to Journey because her dad in New Jersey watches the service, called her up and said, you need to go to this church. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That people in New Jersey are referring people in Central Florida, hey, you need to go to this church in person. So maybe you're watching in New Jersey right now. Thank you for, uh, for that kind uh, plug. That's great. Well, we've been in a series called What Kind of Church for the past few weeks. And among other things, We've been talking about the difference between a Christian, which is a word used only three times in the entire Bible, and it's never defined when it's used, and furthermore, it's kind of a disparaging name given by people outside the Jesus movement to those inside the Jesus movement. So we've been comparing that word, Christian, with another term that's used to describe and define followers of Jesus by followers of Jesus. It's a term that's used 269 times in the Bible, and there's really no way to misdefine or misinterpret it. It means the same thing in America as it did 2,000 years ago in ancient Israel. It means the same thing in Greek or English or any other language. It's the term disciple. And a disciple is a learner, a pupil, an apprentice, an adherent, a follower. And here's a distinction we've made. Christian is a label. Disciple is a lifestyle. Christian is a label. Disciple is a lifestyle. We've said it's the difference between singing the national anthem and joining the army. One is ceremonial. The other is sacrificial. Or it's the difference between having a mascot and a master. A mascot is something we like to trot out to rally people to our cause. A master is someone you obey whenever they call. Jesus did not tell, did not call the 12 Christians to come and follow him. He did not say to his earliest followers, go therefore and make Christians of all nations. In fact, Jesus never called anyone a Christian. But he did tell his original followers this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make what? Say that word. Disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I want to talk about this, I want to talk about the teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you part of what is commonly called the Great Commission. Now, over the years, we've talked a lot about the go part, and we've talked a lot about the make disciples part and of the all nations part, and in the Christian church, we talk a lot about baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit part. It, in fact, it's kind of one of the things that we're known for. I heard about a, a Christian preacher whose uh, daughter, they were at home and, and, and she was in the bathroom and she was playing church. And so she was baptizing her dolls in the bathtub. And the, the dad kind of walked by, and he didn't want to interrupt. He just kind of wanted to listen to what she was saying. And, and she'd say to a doll, she'd say, and I'll baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and then the whole you go. <laughs> well, well, we're pretty good in the Christian church about in the whole you go. We got that part down. But we don't talk so much about the teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you part. In fact, some have called this part of the Great Commission the Great Omission. 
Here's what I want you to see that kind of sets up where we're headed today. Jesus did not tell them to teach everything Moses commanded you. Teaching them to obey everything David commanded you, or Elijah commanded you, or Isaiah commanded you, or what any of the other Hebrew prophets, poets, priests, or kings commanded you. Watch this. He didn't even say, teach them everything the Bible commanded you. Some of you get a little nervous about right now. I'm sure they go, wait, wait a minute. Are you telling us not to obey everything in the Bible, pastor? No, I'm not saying that. Jesus did. You say, how on earth can you say that? Because Jesus came to unleash something entirely new into the world. How new? Everybody say that word. Entirely new. First of all, he came to inaugurate a new movement. He said one day on the outskirts of the mostly pagan city of Caesarea Philippi, I will build my church. He wasn't talking about a building. The term is ecclesia, assembly, people, movement, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And this should be one of our favorite prophecies in the Bible because it predicted us, and here we are 2,000 years later. Jesus also came to install a new covenant. That's what Pastor Dustin Agard talked with us about last week. If you haven't seen that message, I heartily recommend that you watch that. Pastor Dustin talked us through how Jesus literally transformed the solemn and sacred Jewish Passover meal right before his disciples dismayed eyes and he told them from now on we're not going to be remembering Moses leading the Israelites out of slavery to Egypt when we take this meal. No, we're going to be remembering me leading the world out of slavery to sin and Satan by giving my body and shedding my blood. You see, Jesus was the Passover to end all Passovers, the temple to end all temples, the priest to end all priests and the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. He came to install a new covenant. But that's not all the new Jesus brought. He not only came to inaugurate a new movement, he came and, and to install a new covenant, he came to instill a new commandment, a new ethos, a new modus operandi for his new movement, new covenant people. In fact, he intended this to be the defining ethic of his disciples going forward from that time to this time to the very end of time. He said one thing is going to be the primary way the world will know that we are his followers. So when Jesus said, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, I think he had something very specific in mind. To understand what that was, we need to return to the upper room where Jesus had his last meal with his disciples before he died. Again, this is something Pastor Dustin Agard spent some time talking about last week with Jesus and the Passover meal. But what we're gonna look at today happened sometime after that transformative meal. And it's recorded in John's Gospel, chapter 13, is where we're gonna be spending most of our time today. John tells us that during the meal, at some point, Judas slipped out to run an errand. At least that's what many of the disciples thought he was doing. I mean, after all, he was the treasurer for the group. He's probably doing something to help the poor. They gave him the benefit of the doubt, but when the door closed behind him, it signaled the first in a series of events that would culminate in a nightmare for everyone in the room. And they should have seen it coming. Jesus put it out there plainly for them. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now where I'm going, you cannot come. I'm convinced that several men in that room didn't hear anything Jesus said after he said that. Jesus was leaving, leaving now, leaving the city, leaving them alone in the city. That was a problem. Since entering Jerusalem, Jesus seemed to have gone out of his way to offend the temple leaders. And it was no secret they were plotting to arrest him. If he left town without them, they wouldn't be safe. This sudden announcement that he was leaving them had to be disorienting and deeply disturbing to them. But then Jesus did what he often did. He changed the subject. He said, a new command I give you. A new command? They didn't need a new command. What they needed was a plan. 
They were in Jerusalem during Passover. Jewish nationalism was at an all-time high. This was the annual commemoration and celebration of the nation's liberation from Egypt. No doubt, first century Jews had mixed emotions celebrating their ancestors' liberation from Egypt while currently occupied by Rome. Passover was an annual reminder of what God could do if only he would do, namely send another Moses or another Joshua to expel the invaders. In fact, the men gathered with Jesus in that room that evening hoped Jesus was, in fact, Joshua 2.0. If this was the case, Passover would be the perfect time for Jesus to reveal his secret identity that on more than one occasion he had forbid them to disclose right about now would be the perfect time to get this kingdom party kicked off by kicking the Romans out. Perhaps Judas' sudden disappearance from the meal had something to do with last-minute preparations for the big reveal. But a new command? I mean, the current catalog of 600-plus commands in the Torah already kept every Jewish man and woman, boy and girl, plenty busy. Besides that, it wasn't that long ago Jesus had downsized the whole mosaic kit and caboodle along with every jot and tittle to basically two commands. Love God, love your neighbor. So why add a third? Why now? Turns out Jesus wasn't adding a command to an existing list of commands. He was doing something far more radical. He continued, a new command I give you, love one another. Jesus made love a verb, and he used the imperative form of the verb, meaning Jesus made love a command, as in go over there and love that guy. Imagine Jesus as a marriage counselor. You know, stop arguing, go home and love each other. Jesus wasn't commanding them to feel something. He was commanding them to do something. I heard about a story of a husband who was meeting with this pastor. And he said, Pastor, he said, I'm just, I'm troubled. I just, I don't, I don't love my wife. And the pastor said, that, that is troubling because the Bible commands you to love your wife. The Bible says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. So you got to love her. And the guy said, you don't understand, Pastor. I don't feel anything for her. The pastor said, okay, let's drop down to another level. Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Your wife is your closest neighbor. You got to love her. The husband said, let me be blunt. I can't stand her anymore, pastor. He said, okay, let's drop down to another level. Jesus said, love your enemies. <laughs> you got to love her. Listen, if you follow Jesus, you can't evade, avoid, circumvent, or sidestep his command to love one another. There's no loopholes here. There's no workarounds. But loving one another wasn't really a new command. Throughout the Old Testament writings, we read many commandments about being loving. That wasn't really new, but Jesus wasn't exactly through. He went a step farther. In fact, what Jesus said next changed the world. And if we would move what came next to the top of our agendas in the church, it would change our families. It would change our neighborhoods. It would change our cities. And eventually, it would change our nation. A new command I give you Love one another as I have loved you. That was new. As I have loved you. Doing to others what one hoped others would do to them in return is no longer the bar. In fact, Jesus not only raises the bar here, he said, I am the bar. Jesus claimed to be the gold standard for love from this time forward for his followers. And this was not love in the abstract or philosophically or in theory, but anchored in a person which made it extraordinarily personal for every man around the room that night. You see, here's the problem with us today. We hear these words 2,000 years later, and when you and I hear Jesus say, as I have loved you, what do we immediately think of? Jesus died on the cross, of course. But these guys hearing these words for the first time that night in that room, they didn't think of that, at least not right then and right there. They thought back over the previous three years of following Jesus, and perhaps each man in the room was transported back to a particular moment in time when Jesus loved them particularly well. In fact, he could have called them out. He could have said something like this, Matthew, 
Matthew, you remember the first time we met? You were despised by your community and embarrassment to your family. You were working as a tax collector, colluding with the Roman government to scam your own people. But I invited you to follow me anyway. Matthew, you extend that same welcoming grace to everyone you meet for the rest of your life. As I've loved you, Matthew. Nathaniel, Nathaniel, you remember the day we met? You remember what you said about me? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? You dissed my hometown, my family, my childhood friends, but I invited you to join the team anyway. Nathaniel, extend that same grace and acceptance to everybody you meet, as I've loved you, Nathaniel. And James and John, you remember the day when you two knuckleheads wanted to nuke a whole Samaritan town just because you didn't think they were hospitable enough to us? And this is really embarrassing for you too. Do you two remember when you asked your mama to ask me if you could have the VIP treatment in the kingdom? And each time you pouted and powered up over others, I pointed you back to humility and service. James and John, extend that same mercy to others as I have loved you And one by one, Jesus could have taken each of them back to a moment in their shared history, reminded them of the patience and kindness and grace he extended to them in spite of their fears, their insecurities, their ignorance, and their doubt. And for good measure, he could have thrown in, and guys, if you think you've seen me love before, tighten your tunic, because you ain't seen anything yet. <laughs> Jesus was about to stage a demonstration of love that would take everybody's breath away, including his own. But before he did that, he wasn't finished with his new command talk just yet. Look at this. By, everybody say that word? Yes. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. The term this is a demonstrative pronoun. Anybody remember demonstrative pronouns from English class? See, I, I did real, real, uh, real well in English class. I can't even talk. <laughs> can't even say class. English class. Thank you. A demonstrative pronoun is used to point to specific objects or people using the word this, that, these, and those. As in, this is my apple. Those are my keys. Take these papers to the clerk. In this case, it's a singular demonstrative pronoun, meaning Jesus submitted one specific behavior that was to be the identifying mark of his followers. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Jesus was saying how we treat, talk about, respond to and care for one another is the identifying mark of a genuine Jesus follower. Not what we believe. Nobody really knows what we believe anyway. I know what I hear people say they believe, but what people truly believe in their heart is really known only to them and the Lord. That's why one of my favorite fallback verses is what Paul wrote to Timothy. By the way, you know what a fallback verse is? A fallback verse is one of those statements in Scripture that you fall back on when you aren't sure about anything else. Kind of like Romans 8, 28. In all things, God works together for the good of those who love the Lord. John 3, 16. You don't know anything else. For God so loved the world. Here's one of my favorite. The Lord knows those who are his own. I can't always tell. <laughs> You can't always tell. But the Lord knows those who are his and those who aren't and what you really believe about him. So let me just tell you, a long time ago, I stopped saying this. Instead of saying, this is what we believe, I started saying this. This is what we teach and expect you to obey. This is what we teach and expect you to obey. After all, that's what Jesus told his followers. He said, teaching them to obey, not believe, not memorize, not categorize, and God forbid, not politicize, but teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. You see, doing makes the difference. Doing changed the world. Love for one another, as Jesus defined it, is the difference maker and the game changer, which means our love for one another should be noticeable, notable, and distinct. This new brand, this new covenant brand of love Jesus calls us to is not easy, nor is it natural. But that's precisely what makes it noticeable, notable, and distinct. I love what this theologian named Don Carson 
wrote. Don Carson said, I suspect one of the reasons why there are so many exhortations in the New Testament for Christians to love other Christians is because this is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> Amen? He continues, what binds us together is not common education, common race, common income levels, common politics, common nationality, common accents, common jobs, or anything else of that sort. Christians come together because they've all been saved by Jesus Christ and owe him a common allegiance. This next statement is gold. In light of this common allegiance, in light of the fact that they've all been loved by Jesus himself, they commit themselves to doing what he says, and he commands them to love one another. Now, I know, I know, heard all this before, love one another, blah, blah, blah. That's so naive, pastor. That's so idealistic. It's way too simplistic. Pastor, it's not how the game is played today. It's just not how the world works. It's not how progress is made. I mean, it's a great talk for Sunday. It's not much help on Monday. I mean, Love isn't a winning strategy in this do-whatever-it-takes-to-win world, is it? Well, perhaps not. But so what? I'm not the one suggesting that Jesus' new covenant command should govern our behavior, responses, language, and tone. Jesus is. You know the Jesus in whose name you pray when your kid acts up. The Jesus in whose name you pray when your marriage blows up. The Jesus in whose name you pray when your finances get messed up. That Jesus, the Jesus, to whom you look up and has your undivided attention whenever tragedy strike, he's the one telling you to do this. And obeying him, regardless of the outcome, is the difference between Jesus being your mascot and Jesus being your master. And if you think his new covenant command sounds impractical, weak, passive, and ineffectual, to us, with all the competitive advantages that life in the 21st century America gives us, imagine how it sounded to the group gathered with him in that upper room. When they entered Jerusalem a few, a few days earlier, they were walking into an ambush like sheep led to a slaughter kind of ambush. The Roman Empire and the Jewish temple held all the cards. The people who opposed Jesus most had all the power. They controlled the crowds by force if necessary. And the best Jesus could come up with was, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Seriously, Jesus, that's all you got? Yep, that's it. Love one another as I've loved you. By the way, quick, interesting historical fact. The Roman Forum is now a tourist attraction surrounded by a city filled with crosses in honor of Jesus. And the remains of the Jewish temple are scattered around the base of its ancient walls, just like Jesus said it would be. Meanwhile, some 2.38 billion people scattered around this planet right now claim some form of allegiance to Jesus Christ. So maybe, just maybe, Jesus was on to something. Maybe Jesus, our master, knows what he's talking about after all. But there's something deeper in Jesus' command that involved a subtle but significant departure from old covenant precedent that could have been lost on the disciples that night. It'd be easy for us to lose it as well. Jesus did not tether his new command to the anchor all Jewish commands were traditionally tethered to, namely love for, fear of, and dedication to God. No, in the same way Jesus transformed the traditional Passover meal into a memorial for himself, Jesus tethered his new command to love one another to himself. His new command represented a not-so-subtle shift from vertical spirituality, where the only thing that matters is just me and God, to horizontal obedience. In other words, the litmus test for being a card-carrying Jesus follower wasn't about doing something religious. It was about doing something relational. It had nothing to do with how one treated God. It had everything to do with how one treats others. Following Jesus didn't require looking for a deeper, more spiritual experience to get closer to God who dwells out there, up there, somewhere. Jesus' followers would demonstrate their devotion to God by putting the person next to them in front of them. You see, Jesus was introducing a one another way of life. And this is something his First followers eventually picked up on because in the New Testament gospels and letters to churches that would be written sometime later, we read some form of the words one another as a command 
59 times. Just a partial list. Bear one another's burdens. Speak to one another. Do not lie to one another. Comfort one another with the hope of the resurrection. Encourage and build up one another. Spur one another on to love and good deeds. Pray for one another. Be hospitable to one another. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Serve one another. Submit to one another. Clothe yourselves in humility toward one another. Here's a hard question. Where do you think all of those one another's came from? Now, I know that's a tough one. I mean, what could possibly be the source for so many one another commands among the first followers of Jesus? Oh, oh, I know this one. Pick me. Love one another as I have loved you. You see, every one another command in the New Testament is just the application of Jesus' new covenant, new commandment. But wait, there's more. There's something still deeper in Jesus' love one another as I've loved you command. Conspicuously missing from Jesus' new command instruction was any reference to his divine right to require such allegiance and obedience, meaning in what was arguably his most future defining set of instructions, Jesus refused to play the God card. Jesus refused to use the favorite line every parent has defaulted to at one time or another to get their kids to obey, and you know what it is. We've all said it. What is it? Because I say so. Because I say so. Jesus said, we're to do this, not because I say so, but because I've done so. Watch this. Even in this final, if you forget everything else I've said, remember this exchange. Jesus did not leverage his holiness, his personal righteousness, his moral authority, or his supernatural abilities. Jesus leveraged his example, how he personally loved. Think about this for a moment. Jesus loved for the people in the room rather than his authority over the people in the room is what he leveraged to instruct and inspire the people in the room. Jesus refused to exercise his power in the traditional ways powers exercised by powerful people. Why? Because he was in introducing something entirely new into the world, something that included a new paradigm for how power was to be used and leveraged among his followers. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. Jesus was not anti-power. In the end, he would declare the scope of his power, and it's pretty impressive. Look what he said. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. How much authority? All. I'd call that a lot of power. Jesus wasn't anti-power. Nor did he ever deny or downplay his privileged relationship with the Father. In fact, he spoke of it on so many occasions, his enemies used it against him to get him crucified. But unlike the powerful and privileged civil and religious leaders in both the empire and the temple, Jesus refused to leverage his privilege and power for his own sake. He totally flipped that script. And during that final Passover meal, he required his followers to do the same. And they got the message. They got the message in part because he did something in that gathering. He demonstrated his new kingdom ethic in one of the most probably awkward and uncomfortable ways imaginable. You know what he did? He washed their feet. And right before we read about that famous incident, John, the writer, includes this fascinating introduction to this epic moment. Take a look at what John writes. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. And that he come from God and was returning to God. All things were under his power. He knew it. In that moment, Jesus understood that his father had given him authority over all things, all people, all events. He could call the shots. Heck, he could even call off the shots that were planned for him to take the following day if he so desired. Later on in his trial before the Roman governor, Pilate, Pilate says, don't you know I have power and authority over you? Now, Jesus didn't say much during his farce of a trial. But he didn't reply to that one. He couldn't let that one go. He said, no, you don't. You would have no authority over me unless my father gave it to you. So here's a great question for all of us modern day Jesus followers to seriously consider. What do you do? What do I do when we realize we've got the power 
We've got the position. We've got the privilege. Here's what Jesus did. He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. And when he finished washing their feet, he put his robe back on. He returned to his place. And he said, which one of you knotheads organized this event and forgot to arrange for someone to wash our feet? Is that what he said? Not really. Actually, here's what he said. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Implication, I know who I am. I know I've got all the power, all the privilege, all the authority over every one of you. I know that. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Later on that evening, Jesus and his band of brothers would suffer disappointment, defeat, and defection. The empire and the temple came together to conspire against them and to crush them. And it seems that love wasn't enough to stop it. And so they lost. By every political calculation, ancient and modern, Jesus lost. Jesus refused to deploy his resources for his own benefit. He refused to employ the toxic tactics used so effectively by the kingdoms of this world. He had come to do the will of his father. And even with the knowledge all authority had been given to him, he stuck to the plan and he lost. And this does not set well with the new standard American version of our faith. Americans like to win. Athletically, militarily, economically, and especially politically. But as it turns out, Jesus was not against winning. It turns out he was playing a different game with a different set of rules and a different definition of winning. Now pay attention. Jesus played to lose so the other team could win. Jesus played to lose so sinners like you and sinners like me could win. So sinners like you and me had a chance and a second chance, and a third chance. And then he extended the invitation to those of us who won because he lost, follow me. Impractical, impossible, illogical. I guess it depends on how you define winning. I want to close by reading a quote to you written by Andy Stanley in his latest book, Not In It to Win It. That's been such a source for me for this series. I want you to listen very carefully. Andy writes, once upon a time, the love one another culture of the church stood in sharp contrast to the bite and devour one another culture of the pagan world. In a society that valued conquest and the consolidation of power above all things, the teaching of Jesus was judged as weak, feminine, and pathetic. By every ancient standard, the God worshiped by Christians lost. He was defeated. He was executed by his enemies. Worse, he surrendered himself to be executed. The odds of Jesus prophesied ecclesia gaining traction were unimaginable and incalculable, but it did. Against all odds, a new movement dedicated to telling the story of a crucified carpenter with no territory, no military or recognized, no military or recognized authority, survived, multiplied, and eventually replaced the two primary forces, the empire and the temple, who were fanatically dedicated to their demise. Christianity not only replaced the dominant religions of the world, it replaced the prevailing worldviews. When the Jesus movement was fueled and informed by his new covenant command, it was neither pathetic nor weak. It was unprecedented. It was unstoppable. It was notable and it was noticeable. It was well, it was pretty much everything the church in America collectively has ceased to be, but it is what we must become again. Doing so will not require political alignment or new political movement. It will require doing something far more demanding than that. 
It will require us to step back onto the original foundation of our faith. It will require us to embrace the new covenant ethic Jesus introduced and illustrated. It will require us to love one another and not just in our hearts. It will require us to love one another on both sides of the political aisle with our words, with our deeds, with our social media posts, with our responses, our resources, and in our sermons. To do anything less is to declare through our actions that we are somehow greater than our master. Andy concludes, we've protested, we've boycotted, we've posted, we've tweeted, we've called people out, we've called people names, we've stereotyped, we've shamed, we've blamed, we've taken sides, we've politicized our churches. What if we took a break from all that and tried this instead? A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Friends, that's the way forward. It's not complicated. It is costly, but it's not complicated. That's how it's done. That's how it was done. Let's do that again. What kind of church are we? What kind of church are we? We're a Jesus-following, disciple-making, grace-receiving, grace-giving church that Jesus promised that his resurrection makes a reality that is known by our love for one another. That's what kind of church we are. Would you join me in prayer? So Father, I thank you that you have given us a good look at just those very simple words, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you by this by this will be known by this. Everybody in the world will know that we're your followers if we love one another. And that love extends to the closest to us, our neighbors, and even our enemies. That's how it was done. That's what won. And that's what will win. And I pray, God, you help us to do that again, to love one another as you have loved us. We pray this in Jesus' name. We all agreed and said.